guys, I appreciate you guys coming online and uh, eager to learn this. Um, of course, this is the 1300. Uh, uh, control, you can bring it over to the... Okay, I have the temperature off. Anyhow, um, this is the 1300. It's pneumatically uh, controlled. Uh, for the Costco people, they get their air from their um, auto service department, and um, their air most of the time is, uh, is nitrogen, which we love that word because it's clean air, because this guy needs clean air. Uh, 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 particles to moisture. Um, for Blaze, um, they have a, their own compressor, correct? Yes. Yeah, their own compressor? Yes, they put an air compressor in. And it's just important <coughs> that um, they maintain that compressor. It's important that they have the right size for that compressor. We're looking for a 50% duty cycle. Uh, that's optimum. Uh, of course, if it closes, goes closer to 100%, it's going to generate um, heat from the uh, compressor. And that heat's going to create um, um, water, and that water will come through the back and come through here, and then it'll turn to, H to H2O when it hits that cold piston, and that's a killer for the piston assembly. It's going to wash away all the uh, lubricant inside the piston, and, um, and uh, 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 we just have to be conscious of that. Um, can, I, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Um, are, do any of the units, do they ever put dryers on them instead? Like run a different compressor for other than that and other equipment yeah. and put a dryer on it? Yeah, that, that, would, that, problem? that would work great, but the dryers are not, if they have them, it's a good thing, but uh, again, they're not cheap. Uh, who am I speaking to? Who am I speaking to? Okay. Uh, Joe, virtual over at oh. uh, Equipment Carry. Okay, Joe, yeah, the, the, the dryers are, are not uh, inexpensive. But, um, of course, a dryer on this thing is fantastic if they're not using nitrogen. But it's not, if they have the compressor uh, um, rated properly, um, it's not necessary uh, other than the fact that it's a, it, we're looking for around a 50% duty cycle, 50% time on, 50% time off. Um, on the cycle so the, the issue then is if they undersize the compressors when you start seeing I just want to make it simple stupid for when our guys go up and look and they start seeing this type of wear or issue they get, if it's undersized is when they start seeing this problem correct yeah, correct or or okay. or they haven't drained their tank in the compressor in two years you know what I mean yeah I do, I do know what you mean <laughs> yeah. so um, <coughs> um, uh, it's not a real big deal and and eventually, they're going to need a piston rebuild just because of the use on it. And, you know, it's, we need to get in there and re-grease it, re-lube it, put new O-rings on it. And that's, that's, that's after quite a while, um, unless they really have a wrong setup. So anyhow, um, it's funny, I could start all over the place, but um, when you power on the machine, it's going to go through a series of, <coughs> those eight digits represent did uh, a segment check, right, all, that all the segments are working. And then it goes to um, a revision number of the control. Kim may ask for that to see what level of control they're on. I'll do it one more time. This one's set at um, 4.09. Uh, what's our latest, you know? We're going to give you some material after because we're going to um, take our notes. We're going we're to create you a trouble guiding, troubleshooting guide. And we're going to tell you what the latest revision of the, of the uh, controller is. This one here has been in engineering. This controller is old, so 4.09 is not the latest uh, rev, but it's not important right now. Okay, this has, um, for the operator, this has three functions in it. It has, um, and I'm hitting the mode button now. Um, that stands for time, four and a half seconds. That's cycle count. Every time we activate it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to give an, uh, a manager in the store or an operator how many cycles he's committed. So sometimes they like using that to see how many pies are making a quick uh, uh, acid test of how many pies are being pressed on this. And that off is, uh, I turned the temp off, I didn't want to uh, deal with a hot platen. But if I just press set and up, I could change the temperature. The set button and up and down. Same thing applies for the seconds. Set button. I hit the mode to get the seconds. Set button up, down. Do you see all that okay? 
Okay. Yeah. Um, right now, since I have the heat off, if I turn the heat on, if I turn the heat on, do you guys see the heat lamp go on? That's an important tech thing um, when you're diagnosing, so we'll get into that a little bit later. I'm going to turn it back down, off again. Okay. Okay, so those are the main functions. Of course, there's other functions that you may be, uh, have to get involved with. Is for example, they say the temperature is not exactly right. We'd have to calibrate the temperature. You bring in a, a parameter or a meter and, and put it in the center and um, you see what temperature this surface is seeing because the RTD and you guys already know all this stuff and, I, and, and I'm sorry if I'm um, 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 going over stuff that's pretty, re, uh, um, uh, pretty much easy that you already know I was trying to use a fancy word there and I forgot it and um, um, uh, there's an offset in here the sensor inside is seeing about 30 degrees more temperature than the surface. We don't calibrate from inside, we calibrate from the surface, so we have an offset in there. And the offsets in the functions here, um, almost if you need to do that, I want you guys to call on that. Um, uh, we'll walk you through uh, entering into the uh, offset mode. And like I said, it could be minus 10 to minus 30, or minus 10, minus 15, to give us the proper temperature. The, 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 the greater the number in the negative, um, allows the machine to get hotter on this surface and it adjusts it by that number if it's reading if it's actual temperature on that RTD at at um, let's say uh, um, 180 well we want this surface to be 150 so we will knock it down by and it doesn't it's not linear I mean it, it you don't go by minus 30 you probably see that it's set at minus 5 minus 10 and you want to bring five more degrees up, you set another five, so it'll be minus uh, 10, minus 15. Does everybody understand that? Steve, just yeah. from the sales end, just go yeah. the top plan is what the heat is, and the bottom plan is not, because the guys from Megaton wouldn't know the. Okay. The, that's the basic thing. The okay. upper platen is the heated surface on our pizza presses. The lower platen is, there's no heat to it, uh, as you can see. Um, so we're only talking about the upper platen and we're talking about offsets and temperature changes. Remember, the pizza presses aren't meant to um, par-bake or, or kill the yeast. The 150 degrees, or some go 180, some go 120, it depends on the uh, customer. Um, all that does is relax the dough. In other words, um, a dough ball that is stretched and it has that injected heat of that temperature will minimize the, um, the um, what's the word, the, shrink the shrinkage back on the platen. That's all that's for. Um, so it's not par baking, it's not killing yeast, it's just relaxing the dough to spread. That's what the temperature's for. Um, so anyhow, um, we have a compressor set up to it, we have a, a operation. Now you got to remember when I hit these buttons, if you can see this, we don't have any air to this so the platen's not going to move. If I hit this button, you know I hold them down for about a second or less. You see, see it counting down because that's a safety feature so that the guy can't do this and then put his hands in here and it keeps his hands on the, the start buttons. The other thing too is, um, uh, what was I going to say here? If you were to hit this button and try to hit this one, see nothing happens? It's, that's the anti-tie down. So an operator can't tie down one button and have one, one hand free and operate the machine. So it has to be, it, there's a fraction of a second that these got to be in contact with each other. And I'm holding it down a little bit so it goes. This is, a, this is called a reset button. You can reset it back. It'll let the air out, drop, drop the lower platen. So um, see, what I, see what happens? See what happens when I don't hold down long enough? Everybody see that? That was held down long enough. So it doesn't allow, lets the platen have time to get up there so the operator's hands are, are, are busy holding the buttons down. So we have two starts, one reset, power button, set button, up and down arrow mode. So we're going to turn it back on. It's going to go through its digital check. It's going to go through its revisions. Sometimes we want to know what revisions in there. All you have to do is turn it off, turn it on, and there's your revision number, 4.09.
It might be five something now, now because I know this is an old one. It's uh, one of the functions I recognize as old. So, any questions on the controller so far? It's a quick overview of the controller from the outside of the machine. Any questions at all? In in the manual, no, not so much. yeah. In the manual, there is that it goes over the operation of the controls too, so step by step. So if you have the operation manual, you can go through that step by step what each button does and how to do it. Okay, um, our equipment, um, with exception to our stone hearth oven line, uses 2,000 ohm RTDs. The way we, sh we have past machinery that use different ohms, we color code the wire. For example, a 2,000 ohm RTD is a blue wire, and you'll see it when I open it up. A 1,000 ohm RTD is a white Teflon wire, and the 100 ohm RTD is red. And over the last, since 1982, there's been upgrades and changes to the controls, changes to the RTDs. But uh, current stuff going out for quite a few years now has been the blue 2000 ohm RTD. Okay, um, I'm going to uh, open this housing right now and just give me a moment. When we finish this video, we're going to edit this to make it quicker. So this is live. So I've already. Just go over to what that, what that for. Okay, oh yeah, thank you. Um, you see this? Here, we know what this is, thick, thin, correct? We want the pizza thicker. We crank this thing down until it hits a stop. That's the thinnest. And then it cranks off over to here. So if you put it here, you're getting a medium press based on the configuration here. If you go here, you got a thinner. And if you go here, you're going thick. Um, with Blaze, um, and I know Costco is somewhere in between here. I'm sure Blaze goes all the way to the thin side. Okay? So this is the pressure adjust. What it does, it lifts the head. And you're talking only about an eighth of an inch. We're only talking about an eighth of an, eighth of an inch lift on this. That's all it is the, 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 from thin to thick. And uh, 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 so uh, uh, the head goes down when we go to thin. The head comes up slightly when we go to thick. The reason why it's not rising now, I have it disconnected so we can get in here real quick. On this, we have two set screws, guys. One set screw uh, embedded into the slot here, and the other set screw locks us in place so it doesn't back off. And um, I'll tell you what, what I really hate for you poor guys, every single one of these uh, screw heads, like uh, socket set screw heads, um, are siliconed up by us per an NSF requirement. So it's a pain in the butt sometimes. You've got to dig that out with a pick or a, a needle nose to dig that out so you can get an Allen wrench in there. My apologies, but it's out of my control. <laughs> so this is a spacer here just for wear and tear on the surface. I'm going to lift this right now and disconnect the controls after I turn it off. So I'm going to lift it now. It's not too friendly working like this because there's nowhere to hold it. Um, if we're going to get in there and work on it, we'd have to disconnect a few things to get this housing out of the way. And you can see it's a GE switch. It just has a quick disconnect here, here, and here. We're not done yet. We've got to pull the controller off. It goes one way. Uh, the metal side up through this way. And then remember I told you about the RTDs being blue. This is the RTD going to the platen. So we're going to pop that off. Guys, use a needle nose here because if you pull this wire, you may pull the connector off. I have it already loosened for me, I think. Yeah. So now this housing is free to come off. And you can see the control in there. There is the chip the CMOS chip with all the software in it, um, we change this chip depending on the customer's uh, way they want to run this uh, controller. And we actually can uh, modify the chip uh, data to, to make it function differently by pulling this off, put another one on. And it's this removable CMOS chip right here. Okay, you see there's, there's four RTD connections. That same control is used for tool, dual heat if we have a lower platen heated. Um, then you'll see four wires go into it, two to, the, to one, which is the one, number one RTD that's on the platen, and number two, it says down in this area here, 
those two would go to a lower. So you'll see on the, on the 1300s and 1100s just one RTD set up to RTD1 on the controller. Any questions? And if you're replacing the control, sometimes you'll see it. No, we're good so far. Okay. What? When you're replacing the control, a lot, you know, I'll get technicians to say, oh, well, it's, the package is open. And that's because we pre program the control before we actually ship it out. Correct. Um, it's pretty much important sometimes if we're really on the ball to say I have a 1300 serial number um, XYZ. We look at our data and we set the offsets and everything to the original factory settings. That's why we actually open the control here and set it to the settings and then package it back up and, and ship it. That's, it. It is imperative that you guys get serial numbers because we can use that to restore a control that's not set to this machine and wherever you're at that we do set the, the uh, offsets for you as part of the service of uh, re replacing controllers. Okay, so I'm going to put this down, and it, this is about as simple of le electrical scheme that you can imagine. You guys do a lot much more difficult stuff, especially when you've got multiple relays driving things, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We use, on the latest versions, we use a solid state relay. Um, the transformer is for just for transforming the 120, if it's a 120 volt machine, down to 12 volts for the controller. That's all that the transformer is being used for. Um, and again, uh, all this wiring is going back through here. This section here, you'll see two heater wires that's going to the control. You see a ground, you'll see the RTD going to the platen surface. And I, and I think I'll grab a platen here. Can we get an upper platen? Yeah. I'll grab a platen and I'll show you what the platen looks like inside there. So all, go ahead. I thought someone had a question. No? Okay. This control, if it's a 120 volt, it's wired for 120 volt. If it's a 240 volt, it's going to jump these, these connections. It's in the wire diagram. 99.9% .9 in the states, it makes no sense for anybody to buy a 240 volt because it's no advantage to the machine because it's the same wattage. These are 1500 watt heaters. If, and with the pizza, the heat is not that important, but other, of our, other equipment of ours, um, um, uh, the wattages are changed. For example, if they order 120, it could be 1750 watts. If you order a 220, 240, it could be 2200 watts because of the, the, the uh, divided by two down draw of the amps. Then you have an advantage. So most customers, uh, suppliers, anybody, the, 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 the most important thing is there's no advantage. Hold on. There's no advantage to uh, 240 volt. And the only advantage, if the guy has an uh, outlet that's 240 right there, he, would he could buy a 240 because it's, he has no uh, electrical service to be done to the, to the, the storefront. Okay. Um, Troubleshooting. First of all, remember I talked about the heater lamp. First thing, the guy's getting no heat, and the heater lamp's on. Can someone ask, tell me what, what's going on? In other words, the control says, hey, I'm sending you 12 volts to, to um, trip that relay to turn on to create heat. If there's no heat, what is going on? And we have a heater lamp showing on the controller. You guys are, are professionals. You, you, you know this already. I get someone brave enough to tell me the answer, or you don't. <laughs> no? Nope. Okay. No problem. Um, obviously, if the heat lamp's on, the controller's doing its job. Um, so, so there's a problem downstream. Either the relay is not switching, and this side is your 12, this side is your coil 12 volt side. This is your power to the heater, and this is direct power for the for the switching to, to turn it on and off. There's also a, also a, a heater light here, and I can't do it when I disconnected it. But if it's if this heater, if you look at this and this heater 
lamp is on, I mean this solid-state lamp's on, it's saying it's getting the 12 volts. So now we're saying it's getting 12 volts, it's recognized it's getting 12 volts, there's something going on between here or here, or a break in the wire, or something like that. Um, when an RTD, you know how RTDs last, uh, if an RTD fails, this thing's going to read a, 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 a open circuit with your own meter, and um, uh, I lost my train of thought here. It's going to receive an open uh, uh, RTD signal, and it knows to turn in to, to turn on and say probe, P-R-O-B. It's telling you you have a um, uh, open uh, probe, so automatically you know what the deal here is on this. Um, the, the, the one way to do it, even before you put it in and test it, and you, brought, you bring in another uh, so, um, RTD, just plug it in on the outside. Just see if that solves that problem, that it's reading temperature and you see it's trying to heat. That would solve the RTD. I would go through doing it on the outside, connecting it, uh, let it dangle down to, to ambient temperature, and see if that function is now relieved by the new RTD. Then you don't have to worry about... Um, uh, worry about uh, what else is wrong, you just go ahead and replace, install the RTD, and we'll show you all that later. Any questions so far? Am I going too fast, or am I not uh, legible, or? All good. Good. Okay. Um, just to add, uh, the, salt, the relay is DC voltage, it's 12 volts DC, and the control is also DC as well. Everything else is AC except for the valve. Which yeah, you're going to get a DC voltage here, but you're switching AC on this side. So you're going to get a 12 volt signal here, and it's going to uh, switch to 120, 240, or whatever they got. And there's a, a plastic cover here, so you can snap that off and get to these wires easier. Just replace it. This is a requirement now to protect people from bolting themselves. Okay, let's say that you, um, the, the, the controller is not even turning on. Um, I, I suspect the transformer, I go look on the um, primary, primary side, um, most likely the, the, I look on the secondary side, most likely the primary side is fine, it's just getting direct uh, voltage and maybe you have a burned out transformer. A lot of this occurs and of course within the one year it occurs um, we're warranted for that but lots of times when this transformer blows it had something to do with the store spike it took a surge did something and it blew this transformer. Um, so uh, if you got no power at all like it's dead I'd find out if you're getting uh, you're, you're probably not getting secondary um, uh, 12 volts from the secondary side and that just means replace the controller. I mean to replace the transformer, sorry. Okay, um, let me go right to this. One big problem, and uh, uh, people from Ed Edward Don would know that um, level's critical with Blaze. Blaze is doing something different than most any other pizza uh, outfit with regards to a custom lower platen with a groove in it. Costco um, it rarely has this issue because it's just standard flat press. We're trying to, to uh, uh, um, enhance the leveling system so it's, all, it's a no-brainer. And we got this on the drawing boards right now to, uh, to do a self-leveling system to eliminate that. Um, so um, as we have it today, you have four bolts up here, guys. You have an adjustment screw, that big half-13 bolt below and then you have a uh, I think this is a 5816 um, as a, called a locking screw. So what we do is if we're going to level the system we're going to pull these four locking bolts out and you need, a, uh, you need a socket that fits in there or something that you can grab this because when you turn the front down and, it, and I'm talking about turn it by one, uh, one eighth starting out. It's, if you, if some people would want to crank that a little more and what happens is they really set the thing off and level. You start little and you just keep growing it until you get the right level. So if we see it thicker on this side then we would probably take this down an eighth of a turn and try it. And, and if, if, if that works everything's fine, it's level. You just come back in here 
make sure you do not move that lock, that uh, adjustment bolt because you'll change the thickness and you come down here and you lock this back in place and there's four bolts depending on where the end result of the pie is usually what we do is we pull the pie out we look at it and sometimes I would I would press right here press right here press right here press right here in the dough it gives me a better visual how thick or what we need to do to for the thickness change um, that's how it works um, and when it comes to all the different recipes of dough, everything's different. That's been the, the biggest uh, headache is to, that we can't, we don't have, for example, blazed dough. Blazed dough works altogether different than Costco. And um, we're just using the standard dough. Um, I want to eliminate the whole, we're using dough to level the machine. The only thing that works for all these years is the real thing. We used uh, modeling clay before. And we use little sections and wax paper, and we actually do a micrometer check to round. Uh, they should be around. Um, oh, geez. Between uh, forty thousandths and eighty thousandths. Believe it or not, we're talking thousandths for a pizza, and it actually makes a big difference because after it rises and everything, it really just magnifies. So um, we're, work we're working on a self-leveling -leve spring system. And the reason why it's so tough, guys, is when I apply pressure to this, if you look on the side of the machine, you'll see the head. Look at me here, Mike. You'll see the head kind of do this in a way because of the flex involved, okay, when this thing comes up. So you'll see most of the time, if you look down below, well, you can't see it on this one. On 1100, you can. You'll see that these bolts in front are down further most 99.9% .9 of the time than the ones in back to compensate for the for the uh, flex and never do you sit there and you press the machine and you look at it without any dough in it and you look and you go it's not even well it has no uh, force to level up to uh, flex the platen so it's a it only can be checked when you press dough a lot of times they'll call and say my platen's not level I'm looking at it on the side well don't do that because it will look unlevel because of the um, the flexing in the in the post in the back. Okay, uh, we talked about the leveling system. Any questions on the leveling system? If you do it for the first time, you're going to be there a little bit longer to get the feel for it. But the, the the rule of thumb is, little is better. Do a little at a time because if you turn this thing a half a turn, you may send that thing way out of whack. It's very sensitive in that respect. Okay, we have a power distribution cable that brings power from the bottom. It's coming back here from the cord, brings it up here, takes power to the bottom, and it, uh, just, it's a power distribution cable for, for distributing the power. Okay, we just had one incident where a service tech, um, uh, they, they couldn't have turned the crank. Well, they would unscrew the screw, remember the two set screws and stuff, and they come in here and there's a set screw right up here that locks this together. That set screw is held by Loctite, not the kind that you need a torch to, to uh, break it, but it, you'll have to give it a good torque twist to, to break it, probably a longer handle uh, Allen wrench. Um, sometimes the, these kind of Allen wrenches like this here would cause, would be not enough uh, torque to break it, to break it. So a nice one this way would be easier, just a quick torque. You, you can even use a cheater bar, a piece of tubing or something to help you. You just need to break this so this will come off. I'm not going to dwell too much on this because this is rare, but since it came up, so I thought um, I'd give Kim some more training on it um, uh, and we could talk about it. All this guy does is hits, uh, there's four bolts that I pulled out of here already, it's right here. All this guy does is stop against the bolt to thick or, uh, no, to thin, to thin or come this way. So there's your matter, this is how much you turn it, it's all it turns. So th thick, thin, when this is all together, loctited, set, screwed together. Okay, I'm going to take apart this. When I take apart this, um, I think it's a three-quarter, three-quarters, six nut. If I take this apart, guys, And I've already taken the bolts out of here. Let's see if I can pop that out. Yeah. There's 
where we need some kind of tools here to get it out. You'll see down below another, another nut, a flat surface there. And you can see these threads are for crank, the crank turning. When it's locked together, it's going to turn this thread action down below. In the post, there's a welded big nut in there. And um, it's actually threading this down by the thin, threading it up by the thick. And so, like I said, it's only this much of a turn, which turns it from uh, minimum to maximum. And then the way you pull this out is, this is loose now. This is called the adjustment screw. I bet you it's 110.42. Um, there it is. Now you see down below, you see the welded nut in there. And literally that head can come up now. It, there's nothing holding that head to come up. But the guy had this thing, it wasn't moving, so I wanted him to remove all this, clean the threads, re-grease it, bring it back down and reset it. When we, when we, um, I think that's all I want to bring up to that right now because um, anything else that occurs out of what we talked about, Kim's sufficient enough to answer those questions to help you through it. But I'm not going to worry about putting that back together right now. You guys with me still? Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay, um, <laughs> in operations of the machine, this thing will not function out here. Because if you look down here, you have a, a roller plunger switch that engages, that uh, completes the circuit and allows you to, to activate. If that's not down, it's not moving. You can see what happens here. You guys see that? Okay. The other thing to the lower platen, if you look down below, there's a few things we did to improve this. When this thing sits out here, it has a tendency for people to bang on it, press dough, get this thing to flex a little bit. And in the past, we'd be clanging trying to match that because it's uh, not flat anymore. We've eliminated that by having this guy here as an as a assist to rise it. And there's a ramp right here. You can see how it lifts it automatically no matter what level it is. It kind of solved the problem. And that's, has a little bit of tension to it, so it kind of stays the platen in place. But once it's in place, it disappears, and it's now ready to activate. This guy here, if it's having trouble still striking this at the right distance, this guy here has an adjustment down below with a nut, that's a nut and a, a, a screw that you can actually raise or lower this to help the platen right over that hump. Okay, this surface here for Costco is a hard, hard anodized Teflon impregnation. Much sturdier surface uh, for as many pies that people do that this lasts a lot longer than our standard Teflon. Costco we do this for and all of our other standard machines with exception to Blaze. Blaze likes the Teflon and we're working on that right now because the amount of pies Blaze do, believe me, I've never seen, I've never seen it to where this machine can't even maintain temperature because they do so many pizza presses that it just blows my mind the volume is coming out of there, which is a good thing for, uh, for everybody. So, um, so we're working on a little bit higher wattage, especially for um, Blaze right now. All the problems, uh, Edward Don, um, that we've uh, countered out there, we're, we're, we're on it and we're rectifying it by changing the molds so there's no uh, issue where the dough squirts past the, the, the uh, crust line. Um, we're, this machine actually is the one we're going to be putting together and, um, and, and test the new configuration we have done. And that's coming out shortly. We just need to prove it out and test it. Um, this is very important, guys. This, this we, call it, um, we call it the banana bracket. But this guy here engages underneath this casting right here. And what that does is if there's too much gap there, when that, va that vacuum is so great, when the, when, the, when the air tries to release the platens, it'll stick with this um, top surface, and you'll hear a big clanging noise. Well, it's th this is not tight enough to this, and there's shim washers in here to, to get it to the right height, but most of the time it stays the same, but that's that clanging noise is there's too much gap between the, the banana bracket and the casting lower platen arm, we call it, right here. 
Okay. Alrighty then. Okay, so um, I want to get involved with the air part of it right now. <coughs> um, Costco, uh, Costco has a um, has a situation where if there is water damage starting from any part of the air system that water has caused something to not operate properly, that is not under warranty. And they're, they're totally in agreement with this. That's the, the deal. That's really the only thing we, we um, cannot control is their compressor and their maintenance to maintain the piece of equipment. So for Costco, that, that uh, any water damage, and in fact, across the board, any water damage, I cannot control the um, maintenance and the proper size compressor. That is up to the customer, and it's not under warranty. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, it's Virgil. Um, I'm wondering, we, we spoke briefly on the, uh, on that piece, the PM piece, the preventative maintenance piece. Is there a kit or something like that you guys have that it would include like a, a food safe lubricant and maybe an O-ring kit or something? Just, I want to try to be proactive on that so we can bring them a solution instead of afterwards hitting them with a big bill when they do have damage and we notice it because the unit stopped functioning properly. Yeah, we have a, 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 a rebuild kit, it's called. It consists of the two o rings. It yeah. consists the piston rebuild kit consists of the lubricant, two o rings, and the gasket. Three o rings. Three o rings and the gasket. And we'll show you that in a minute. It kind of jumped ahead. I'm gonna, I have the piston out here. I'm going to show you all about that. Um, yeah, there's a kit involved, and it has everything you need to rebuild the the piston. Biggest part with that is probably the labor of dismantling the whole system. Yeah. What what time? How much time does that take approximately? Well, um, if you never did it before, over an hour, <laughs> over an hour. Yeah. Yeah. If you've done, if you've done two or three, half an hour to forty-five minutes depends on if everything goes well. And does it require any special tools, gear pullers, or anything like that? No, sir. Unless, awesome. unless the piston is damaged somehow and it's jamming against the wall, that's a precision fit in there. But yeah. most of the time, that don't, that doesn't happen. It's just. It just doesn't have any lubricant in the, and I'll show you, I'll tell you how you can tell right away it needs a rebuild kit, which is obvious, but I'll get into that in a second, guys. I'm going to put the machine there. If I go back to the back of the machine, we have a, we have a filter on here, and inside there, if you could see, it right here, you see this, uh, this micron filter? This micron filter unscrews, and this is replaceable, because Anytime you restrict your airflow, let's say this is all clogged up. Anytime the airflow is restricted, you're going to see it slowly coming up, or you're going to see it not coming up at all. This is the first thing I'd check, and I would check it by just removing this and let it run freely without the filter by putting this all back together again, O-ring, etc., and try it without the filter. If the filter is the problem, we sell these separately. Okay, I'm going to uh, muscle this machine over so we can uh, get underneath here. What do you want to do this? We're going to flip it like this. Okay. We've got our hernia belts on. <laughs> there we go. I did tell them, was this removed? And they said yes. <laughs> um, I hate to do this, guys. I'm going to have to unscrew all these bolts because I asked them to have this housing removed. In fact, go start on. I'll get another tool. Sorry, guys. I asked this to be removed. And it wasn't. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Um, Go into that or? This, this guy here, I mean, um, and I, I'm, I'm not going to blow our own horn. There is nothing with our competitors that comes close to this machine. Costco tried to use the competitors for about a year, and the thing just didn't hold up. First of all, we build our own pistons. These guys use, uh, other guys use like uh, store-bought pistons. If they were to use an 8-inch piston, you guys would know how big that store-bought cylinder would look like. Ours is custom built into the machine, and we got a heck more force than anybody out there. And that's why Costco said it's just not working for them. They want that force, and they came back to us, and we got we we made sure we did well by them, and we improved upon anything they wanted to make this thing foolproof. And uh, this is built like a, if I could say this, a shit brick house. We're almost done here. I think it's the first time I ever seen Glenn with a screwdriver in his hand. I'm loving this. Don't get used to it. <laughs> this arm right here, this pivot arm. I'll get to that. The two set screws. Yeah, I'll get to that. Yeah, I'm gonna go back to that. There's actually. All right, more. you're on. Okay, here's what you're looking like when you're looking under here. You have air coming in. You have air. This big three eighths tube is the top air to release the. Uh, Flatten from vacuum. That's why we have more airflow going there to give it a good pop to, to, to loosen that up. The, the exhaust side of that on this big 3 8 tubing that comes from here is this muffler slash um, speed control. You, we can't have that thing driving down normal speed or it's going to really make a loud noise. So we control the speed by this speed control to uh, allow the thing to come down slower than, than the going in the up direction which is just a muffler. So going up this way, it's porting to this and then exhausting from this. This exhaust is taking out the air that's already in there so we can move it up. Remember, there's always air in the down direction with this machine. Once you uh, plug in the air, power the machine up, in fact, not even power the machine, once you plug in the air, you're going to have pressure always down force, down. And when we, when we trip the uh, solenoid, solenoid's going to change the valves the, the, the flow through and then bring the air up and it's going to escape out of here. When it comes down, it escapes out of here on a speed control. And you can see the adjustment feature right here. And you guys are aware of, you guys have seen that before. Um, this, this solenoid valve is an output to the controller. It again, through this coil right here, is getting a signal from the controller to say, okay, I, I'm activating you, it shifts the valve and it sends the air up. And then when it's up, the controller disengages. When the time's up, the controller switches to off. And then the, the, uh, the, the, the static uh, or the normally position of this, the air will come back to the, to the bottom and go. Now, remember talked about air restriction. Anytime the platen is slow coming up, being the lower, slow coming up or not coming up at all, I'd be start looking out, and if you get a 12 volt signal to this solenoid valve, and you can pick that up on the schematic on top in the in the uh, terminal block, um, and if you're getting a signal and it's not coming up, one of two things could occur. First, we talked about the filter back there. Next restriction will be in this valve, and what happens over a period of time? I've seen it, and it's been it takes a long time, but it does. I've seen it happen to where these mufflers got so dirty that it didn't let the air through. The way you test that, it just, if you want to test, uh, let me see here. If you want to test going up, it's not coming up, it's probably this muffler that's clogged up. Just unscrew it and see how it works. It's going to be loud and you get that replaced, but that'll diagnose that's what the problem is. I rarely see it the other way, and I'll get more involved in that in a minute. Um, there's 12 bolts here that seal this piston, and I'm going to try to bring the other casting here so I can show you the assembly of it. And this casting I have is a machine casting partially built. Can we do it on the floor? Mm -hmm. Can you guys see that okay? Can you guys can you guys see that? Okay. Um, you can see here's a piston wall. If for example and here's a big way to check this if the customers complain they're leaking air, what is occurring is, remember, we have air force going down. You have a, here's the piston, the way it looks 
in the machine and you have two O-rings, one here and another one here and then you have one here up on, up on this groove right here. What is probably occurring since the piston got worn out and it's leaking air, right away that's a, that's a water damage problem. They got the water in there to where they have literally um, um, ruined, uh, corroded the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, um, cylinder grease and it's worn down this, the O-rings. So usually it happens when it's trying to force air up. Sitting in a static position, you hear air leak. Probably this guy's worn out because it's coming right through this, this arm, which is over here. <coughs> the air is really coming through the machine and out this here, and you hear a hissing sound. And that's definite rebuilt, plastic, uh, rebuilt uh, piston kits uh, work. So when we take the piston apart, we remove these bolts. You'll see the, 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 the uh, gasket that's in there. You'll see this guy. You'll see the face of this in there. You see these bolts here, guys? That, that's not there. These bolt holes, just to show you, maybe you asked about gear pullers. This is our makeshift gear puller. You screw in some bolts. These are 3816 bolts. This doesn't come with it, by the way. And you now have the ability to handle that piston to pull it out once everything's disconnected. And I'll show you. This piston here is through the machine and let me see where that stuff is. This is parts. There is a bolt, a screw with a, 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 a coupling. Uh, there we go. There is a, uh, I'm missing it, it was here yesterday, but there is a bolt this goes through here, and we use, um, we, when we, huh? Question? No? Okay. This bolt has, um, uses um, uh, Teflon tape to seal it. Because it's there, it would leak air if it doesn't. And then through, through this other side, this is sitting like this, there is a coupling nut here, and a threaded, threaded rod coming through. Oh, here it is to this side. You see that? So basically it looks like this with the piston through here. And um, this is sitting in here so you have to remove this so you can free this arm from coming up to pull the piston out because this is what's going to hold it. Now I'm going to go to this arm and I'm going to come around here. On this side, Mike, can you get there? I'm trying to get there. There's our famous silicone again. No, it's not there yet. There's uh, two, two set screws here and two set screws down here. Again, the set screw, one's locking, one's uh, jamming against this slot here. And, and you've got to remove the one set screw and take out the one below it on each side to free that. A lot of people got confused with that in the field. So that, that you've got to free that whole uh, cylinder from this top part holding it together. Does that make sense, guys? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Um, we'll go, we're going to go back into here now. And now we've pulled the piston out by using our pullers. You pull it out. And now you got everything exposed. You got the wall here. You can see where you can see where the grease disappears. You may see black from the from the O-ring wearing out, mixed with the grease, if there's any left. Um, you got to clean the surface with a uh, whatever whatever uh, mineral spirit solvent you can have to clean that out. Inspect the piston for any dings or marks. If there is a ding or mark in here, that may cause this thing to be a pain in the neck getting out. But once you pull it out, you need to lightly sand that nick out of there so it um, is free from that. In this spot right here, at that, that's a helicoil in there. You're missing a little post that we have in there that guides the platen in an up direction. And I'll tell you right now, the it's right here, and there's a there's a there's a Daron bushing in here that's for wear and tear. It kind of guides it up and down in a straight position. Before you remove it, 
make sure that you mark this and mark this so you can put it back in the exact same position. That's that's a that's a, that's a that's a trick right there. You can use a use a marker, indelible ink marker, but you got to line them back up before you put the new one in. Okay, so so we pull it apart. We clean this now. We're inspecting this. We're cleaning all this out. We're removing the old the the O rings here and here. We're cleaning all this out for the residue old grease, and then we start greasing it again. We supply the grease, and if you guys are familiar with uh, cylinder cylinder lubricant, um, that's what we use. We don't use standard grease. It's a it's a it's a grease four cylinders, and we have these little kits here that come with it. This one's a Magna Lube brand. So here's your grease you need to um, to, to put the system back together again. So what we do is. We'll clean this all up. I'll take these O-rings. I'll put my fingers in the grease. I'll do this. I'll put them in, making sure there's enough grease in there. I do that for the second one. And I do that for the third one. Grease and slip into here. Roll it right down to here. And then, um, and then the wall surface here, you need to put the grease in here again. Re-grease it in this area. And then, um, This is going to be greased up too. Just you know, slop the grease on there, whatever you, as much as you have. Um, any questions on this so far? Okay, this gasket, grease it up before you put it in there. Throw the grease on there, and you'll mount it back onto here with the grease. And you'll put that together. You close and you close up the the uh, 12 bolts, and all techs know to slowly bring each one of them down to you don't cause any uh, unevenness and pressure and then then tighten them all down a nice good good turn on each one of those 12 bolts and that that is rebuilding the piston okay um, the sonar valve sonar valve if the signal if you know you're getting signal to go to this valve and there's no signal um, let me see how I can work that. If you see a signal going to this valve, sometimes this coil's sold separately. If you have a coil issue, we can supply the coil. But most of all, most of the assembly is all this at once. We have an older valve, folks, and, and if you guys are seeing older, older machines, you'll see a plastic gray or blue housing. It's called Rexroth. We've replaced it with this automatic valve in recent times, last three or four years ago. And this is a universal bracket that matches the old one to the new one, so it's retrofittable. We don't supply the Rexroth anymore. Okay? And, of course, this is connected here, how you can check your voltages coming in, and, et cetera, to the, to the valve. Um, what else? I can't say that I can think of anything else on this primary uh, training seminar that would... Uh, would warrant sitting there and talking about unless you have a specific issue and, and if what you can't what you don't get knowledge of here call Kim she'll walk you through it um, she'll help you she knows what she's doing on that um, any questions okay um, you have your they've sent you the explosion drawing and parses you guys have this correct Everybody have this? Yeah. Okay. There's your, there's all the parts required. So when you're referring to parts, sorry, I didn't hear you. Oh, absolutely. Um, we'll we'll email them to you. Ever done these emails? I'm gonna I'm gonna formulate a troubleshooting guide. I thought I had one for this machine. Um, that will go through all this. If this happens, try this, 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 and that really is helpful. And we're going to provide that for okay. you shortly. But again, it comes with a manual, the wire diagram, the uh, explosion drawing, all the parts, okay, and the wire diagram, which is right here. Pretty straightforward. Okay, cool. This is not, uh, this, this machine with a couple little pieces of knowledge is very simple. Oh, yeah, I brought the platen in to show you the platen um, unassembled, so I'm going to bring it up here. Thank you, Glenn. 
this is what it looks like when you get that thing out. You see the RTD in there? It's important if you're replacing that, that RTD that you don't pinch this real hard. It doesn't have, this has to be um, one notch stronger than a hand tighten thing with an Allen wrench. You see how it's aimed upward? We want to keep the wire off the surface and we use a grease, a, a, um, a heat sink grease on the end. All the sensing is done on the end to get a better, um, better um, transfer of heat to the RTD back. You got a ground wire, you got your heater wires. Now this is our casting. This is what makes us different than a lot of people. This is an uh, embedded heater element. You can see the heater element in there, guys, right? Yeah. Okay, that is the reason why we can lifetime, limited lifetime warranty this platen. We know this heater will not burn out. Why? Because there's, this aluminum is a great heat sink, draws the heat away from the heater, as opposed to people screwing on heaters on the surface. You guys see it all the time. Where only part of the surface is in contact to the heat source, to the platen, and the rest of it's in the air. And air is the worst, is the best insulator to keep the heat in the heater and it doesn't dissipate. Eventually it will burn out. So what happens after one year of warranty, um, if this heater goes out, we will send this casting at no charge. The customer is liable for the um, labor from your techs. Okay? And one thing else that we do that not too many people do, and you guys know, is we don't use any quick disconnect screw-on heater wires to the heater element uh, cold pin, which is in here. We braze it with silver. And you guys know that's the best way to make sure that it's a sure contact and there's no chance of heat on and off, on and off, that anything loosens up. Because when it loosens up on a screw-on situation, it generates heat and then all of a sudden it burns out right there. So we braze this with silver which makes it a little more difficult if this wire was defective to replace these wires. But this wire does not move. This is not a non-moving part. This wire will not uh, break because on the 1300. So most likely that's never the case. If you're going to determine whether the heater is bad, don't be checking it from the ends, guys, because when we get it, we're going to, we're going to put a probe pin right through this and check it from the cold point. If the cold point shows uh, loss of continuity, then the platen's no good, and we inspect it, and we um, issue the credit on, upon uh, inspection when we get it back. It's important that we get these back. If we don't get it back, um, you know, we're billing out this platen until we get the other one back to inspect it. Once we inspect it, Kim will call you, right, Kim, and tell them the disposition. Yes, the heater was bad. We're sending one out right away. And it's identified by the voltage. This one's 220 volt. This is what we're doing for Blaze right now. We're up in the wattage for Blaze, and we're using this platen. That's, what's, that's why we have it here. Um, and it tells you what the voltage is. All of our voltage up until now, it was 1,500 watts, or to be quite honest, we has changed to 15. It was 1,450. And ohms, um, if I check the ohms, um, I think it's 11 ohms on 120 and um, 22 ohms on 240. I'm, I don't remember offhand. But check it by this spot here to ensure that you're going to get this thing without any rebuttal back from us. Because if it's an issue anywhere out through the machine, you send this back, this wasn't the problem. You sent back a good platen, and um, they're, going to get, they're going to get stuck with that. It's not, it's not a warranty issue. For the lifetime, limited lifetime warranty and platen, why we call it limited is we don't, it could, be, it could be 15 years from now, and the platen's dead, the heater's dead. That platen is replaced for you, lifetime. And um, the only thing being limited is that after one year, we don't warranty the labor from the text. So the customer gets, and this is the big part right here. This is extremely expensive. They get that for free. And we want to drive that home because nobody does this. It's in all our equipment. It's in every single piece of our equipment. We cast the heaters in that uses heat and platens. Every one of them is um, cast in heater and it's a limited lifetime warranty. When you remove the platen, these are little seats. Remember I told you about the lock, the self leveling three-quarter, sixteen, three-quarter six bolt or three-quarter ten, whatever that is? It sits and uses this as a wear point. So you got these are siliconed in just to hold them. Make sure these are back in there. You don't want the pressure being applied to the aluminum underneath there to start malleably disforming. Uh, I think that's it, guys. I just want to quickly just show them the 1100. Yeah, I'm gonna, we're going to switch gears and show you 1100. 
anything regarding the heat and the controller is identical except it's a manual press, you're going to see our latest new touchscreen control, which is not out yet. Um, So the ones that are out there currently, yeah, ones that are out there currently is our LED red, etc. Next year or sometime we're going to be uh, installing this on all of our controllers and it's kind of cool. It can do all kinds of darn things. There's your menu, 150F, 330. I'm not going to get too involved with that because you're not going to see this for a while. So we're going to ignore this part. But as far as the 1100 goes, this is a uh, rick rack and pinion system. Here's the same thing with thick and thin. It has double set screws back here. It has a screw here, just this unscrewed, and this screw, you lift the whole thing out. There's a, uh, a wear washer here. Kim, can you hold this one? Being lit, you can see the green light on the controller. Um, okay. If you look back here, here's the rack and pinion system in here. So when we pull that pressure down, this rack dra draws that down. It's all by hand pressure to keep it in place. This rack and pinion, um, if, if this is having problems, it might be a tooth worn or something like that, we have to drive that out and put new ones in. There's um, Woodruff, screw, Woodruff uh, keys holding these things in place on the arm, and it's bolt driven right from here. And again, we have... Um, uh, uh, what we call 400 degree F temperature for the grease. This gets hot, but this grease, if you put in a the grease that flows at a lesser temperature, let's say on the pizza machines it's not really a big thing being 150, but our tortilla press, et cetera, et cetera if you put a uh, grease not up to the temperature, it'll start running like w water and it'll be all over the place. This is our, um, this is changing too. In the near future, we've been testing it, testing a new spring system here. This is our tension strap with a brass bushing in here, and it gives tension so the handle stays in place. At any given time, this thing loosens up. There's a bolt right here. You can tighten it up again right from the bottom. A lot too many people don't know about that. The silicone's in that too. Yeah, you got silicone everywhere. You got to dig it out. It's good to have a, a pick or some sharp instrument and a, real fine needle nose to pull that stuff out. Um, this right here, if I could turn it, right, if you look in here, there's the cam ramp. This sits thin on this side and the cam ramp, the, the cam ramp's contour goes up when you want to, when you want to do thick, so it changes the, the other opposite side of this is where it strikes, so it changes the thickness for you. This here is your counter or your activator for time, and uh, it also counts cycle counts just like the other one. Same SSR, SSR same type of transformer. This transformer has a, a protection on the primary, the secondary side with a one amp fuse. You can see it there. Um, platen looks the same. Controller is the same idea as we talked about before. Um, not this one, but the ones that we have currently in the field. Um, let me think of this. The uh, lower platen, let me show you how that works, guys. The lower platen still has to do the same kind of ramping, but it's different here. It doesn't ramp. It has that gap in here, as you can see. And when you apply pressure, that gap's going to go away. And this bolt right here, right here, it catches the inside of this, so when we pull it up, it holds it in place so it doesn't come up. Um, it doesn't come up uh, and, and uh, not allow the, the, the platens to split apart. Um, this is adjustable, too, if it's a problem. Um, this pit, the lower platen is only held by nothing. You can see it? If this thing is getting hard to turn, we may have to remove and clean the grease and re-grease it. That part you grease it with a food grade grease because it's exposed and, and uh, we call it high temp food grade grease. We have it here. If you don't, um, we'll allow it not to run black because if they put other grease on it, the standard grease that we use internally, that will turn black and start running all over. So it has to be used with a food, uh, food grade white grease. Now. Um, the adjustment on the levelness is instead of inside the machine, they're right here. You just have to pull these 
My hands are all greasy. Okay, I got it. See, see the same thing goes. Now you can see the gap. The back's probably um, higher up this. You see the gap space there. And the same thing about leveling is the same locking bolt and adjustment uh, thickness, I mean uh, leveling bolt. Same exact thing as that, but it's, on, it's, it's being shown here. Um, what else? Anything else I missed? No. So, now that you know a little bit, it seems to be a lot more simpler than uh, showing up for the first time and never seen a darn thing. But, um, again, we want to carry this on. We'll do some packets for you guys to, to, to uh, have the troubleshooting guide, et cetera, et cetera, to have for these machines so it makes it real easy to go right down that list. And you've been out a couple calls, you'll know exactly what to do. It's really a pretty much simple deal once you know. You also need to sign up for our website. Guys, if they have everybody sign up on our website, because all this, the video is going to be on there, our spec sheets are on there, our operation manuals are on there. Everything that you need out in the field is on that website. So if you sign up to get onto our website, we get, we'll send you back a password so you can get into it. Anything you need is in, in, that, in there internally. So any time of day, you can go on a computer or an iPad and, and pick up information that you might need that you don't have with you. So be sure to get your guys to sign up and everybody sign up on our website and that way you can get any technical stuff you need. Um, it's all in there and the video will be in there and we have some videos on our other equipment also. You we're constantly um, adding videos to the service side to help out. So, so again, your feedback is important to us. Guys, if you've got a better idea and you see something happening and you suggest something, we're going to jump on it we're going to investigate it. We, we want to learn from you guys in the field also. Okay, I think that concludes it. Are there any questions? Don't be bashful. Hey, uh, Kim, it's Virgil. Um, we talked to about some stuff we could actually load up onto our iPads for our, all of our technicians have iPads. Is getting something um, uh, that we can just throw on it. What we went through today is good information, but it might be a little long to put on the iPad, so they would see something like this more on your website. Are you building anything like that, or is there specific stuff we should be looking for working on our end? Is the iPad uh, um, uh, connected to uh, uh, 4G, 3G, or uh, web? Yeah, yeah, they're hot and Wi-Fi, both. Oh, good. Um, you know, it'd be nice to have certain sections of the machine, and let's say you want to rebuild a piston, all you see is the piston rebuild uh, 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 video, right? Yeah, if you could break it up by kind of modular, like almost like when we talk about that troubleshooting document, but have a walkthrough on the individual pieces of the equipment as to what almost a cause and effect troubleshoot would be really helpful. We'll see if we can uh, accommodate you shortly on that. Yeah, we want to we want to partner up with you guys in service. We want to make sure that we take care of you, you take care of us, and we need to know what you need to do a better job for our, all of our customers. Yeah. See, seeing this breakout today is really good for me because I don't spend enough time in the field. So seeing everything on there, nothing is out of the realm of what our technicians are doing on a daily basis. We just the individual technical information because your unit is obviously more complex than just you know guys smashing this with his with his hand. Yeah. Um, yeah. We'll, we'll want to make sure that we uh, the the doc are there for them to re refer to when they're actually pulling this thing apart. Yeah, this is a kind of thing where you it's, it's an overview. And now you go, I remember he talked about it, and it was something like, it gives you a better idea because then we get into the individual videos, you'll have a better idea. Yeah, that's, that's perfect. Because obviously, if the guy's coming there and the issue is leveling or the issue the, is a heating issue or what have you, he's going to want to sit through the whole piston rebuild. You know what I mean? But at the same time, from a PM standpoint, we're looking at it, I want him to know what to look for. Um, if there is an issue that could be being caused by the piston that would require rebuild, like where is he looking for condensation or where is he looking for uh, rust or wear or what have you. So really break it out by how it's affecting the customer and what's the quickest, easiest way for him to see what direction he should take next.
Yeah, we'll uh, we'll try to do that for you. We'll uh, put up a game plan and, and see if we can't start doing that for you. The the co the uh, troubleshooting guide. Um, wish I wish I, I I started it, but I jumped off of it. But the troubleshooting guide um, will tell you like no power. Check this. Check this. Check this. Check this. If this occurs, you need to replace this part. And it's pretty much um, it's pretty simple. And it's a spreadsheet cause and effect thing. If this happens, this could be the problem, and what do you do to fix it? If that's not the problem, the next thing would be this could be the problem, what do you do to fix it? So you have a basically an area which you're um, emphasizing on because of the symptoms, and then you have all the, all the cause and effects and what you need on that uh, troubleshooting guide. Yeah, perfect. That's exactly what we're looking for. And our team, uh, our technical diagnostic team, would use that too if a technician walked into, say, he was covering for another tech and it's first time out of Costco looking at one of these units, he would call them and they would walk them through that same information. So that, that's perfect. Anything that really, I don't want to say dumps it down, but really focuses on cause and effect is very helpful for our team. Yeah, that troubleshooting guy is exactly what you need.